Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to another uh, Perio Micro Conference. Uh, my name is Patrick Masson. I'm the executive director of the Perio Foundation, and uh, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to join us today. Um, as you may know, these uh, micro conferences started uh, when, as part of the Aperio uh, Board Strategic Planning, we invited some folks in uh, to give insights on various aspects of open source software and communities, um, educational initiatives that may impact ed education technology, and so on. And they were popular with that core group, so we've we've kept them going, um, and I'm excited to see a nice representation from all of our projects and the board again uh, being here. Um, we've been blessed to have uh, some really great speakers from open source software uh, communities, Deb Bryant uh, from Open Source Initiative, Deb Nicholson from Python, Mike Malinkovich from Eclipse Foundation, uh, Pierre Yves Gibello from uh, OW2 um, from the community, um, uh, Hong Dang from um, uh, Open Source uh, Asia, uh, from Education, Cable Green, um, Wes Turner, uh, Cables from um, Creative Commons, and uh, Wes is a board, uh, Perio board member and also teaches uh, open source uh, courses at RPI. So we had a great collection of folks um, that have presented with us. And just as a reminder, we have uh, more microconferences scheduled, um, again, spanning community, uh, projects, education. Uh, so mark your calendars. They're the second uh, Wednesdays of the month, and you should get some uh, reminders. Uh, please feel free to share the link uh, with other folks in your projects if they want to join up. And if you have any ideas for next year, uh, feel free to let me know uh, through conference.apera.org. And we do post all of the uh, recordings uh, to Apera's YouTube channel. And there's a hopefully easy to remember link that you can get there. Um, today is uh, no different. We have another, I can honestly say, a global presence in um, open source. Uh, we were joking a little bit before uh, we started up that every time I see Samson a post or something, he's in some other country at some other conference working with some other group. Um, so I'd like to thank him for being here today. Uh, Samson, I believe, got his sort of open source start with the uh, Sugar program, Sugar Lab, Sugar Desktop for the one laptop per child. Uh, program, but in typical fashion, I, he quickly rose within the organization and uh, I believe served on the equivalent to the board of directors there and helped leading the projects uh, with the Sugar Desktop. Um, he, I only put two uh, associations here because they're community oriented, but this is by no means the, the total scope of his activity in open source, but uh, currently he's uh, well, he's the co-founder and probably one of the lead, still one of the lead drivers beside, behind Open Source Community Africa, and he's also a board member of Open Source Collective. And I think those two organizations and his work there really captures his uh, focus on developing and, and creating and fostering community with an open source, uh, community management, community development, developer relations, that sort of thing. Um, in addition to those two uh, initiatives, he's worked with uh, a variety of African governments, International Telecommunications uh, Union, the African Union, the United Nations, including the UN's Girls Can Code Initiative. Um, as I mentioned earlier, he's an international speaker. Um, he just got back from the uh, Linux Foundation's Open Source Congress. Um, he's a contributor uh, to the Sustain o, uh, Open Source, uh, Sustain OSS, Sustain Open Source Software uh, project. Um, he has spoken at the Open UK's State of Open Con. Uh, of course, he's still involved with the Open Source Community Africa Festival. Um, I could keep going, but this entire uh, hour would be taken up by listing his accomplishments. Um, but I think the thing that really to me, summarizes 
is uh, Samson's work and his commitment to um, community is the the mission or the tagline for the open source community Africa uh, to serve as a catalyst for the world's next billion creators. And I think that to me summarizes the work he's doing is um, and his experience and his tips and tricks and tools of the trade, I think will really help Sakai, uh, OpenCast, Xerti, um, all of the, the projects here in Aperio and even the Aperio Foundation as we work to uh, grow and cultivate our own community around the foundation of the project. So I'd like to welcome uh, Samson and thank him for being here. And I will turn it over now by hopefully clicking the right buttons. And Samson, welcome, and you should be all set. Thanks so much. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, it's actually really interesting because um, over the years, I keep running to Patrick in person at multiple events and, you know, happy to, again, run into him again uh, virtually. So, uh, yeah. So, anyways. Forgive me because I um, I keep saying this whenever I go to speak at events that I'm one of the most horrible people when it comes to slides. The reason is because sometimes I feel like the slides control me a little bit and it makes me to share less, uh, maybe because of like some things that I could jot uh, down from from my brain, obviously, to, to text. Uh, but also, again, um, just like what I mentioned earlier, um, if you do have any questions real time, uh, please, you know, feel free to use the, the, the chat channel or sorry, the public chat uh, feature, and then um, I'm gonna um, take a look at it and also uh, reply. So yeah, um, today I'm gonna be talking more about um, what it means from you know how to get users into contributors. Uh, this is actually pretty typical because most of the time it's always around how do you get contributors to become users. But then um, over the years, we realized that, you know, if you're contributing to open source uh, because you want to get into the open source project or you want to get started into a project, automatically that makes you become a user. Maybe not necessarily user by design, but user in a way that you understand the product or in this case, the project in order for you to contribute. So um, here I'm going to be sharing some strategy to become more effective in community management. But um, I'm going to be doing this in a very interesting way, um, in a way where uh, I'm going to be sharing a little bit about what I felt like the, the folks at OLPC and what we did with Sugar Labs um, made it more effective, given the fact that, you know, it wasn't one, it was a project that was based on education, but also a project that was, I would say, was really, really challenging because of the audience that we're serving, which is more of people under the age of, uh, I would say, by default, 15 years old. So it's like building a community of like really young people in, in primary and, and secondary school, or in this case, uh, junior high and grade schools. Um, so yeah, um, basically what I was explaining earlier with the, the whole concept of this, this talk, I would say this idea is, again, trying to make sure that we, or in this case, like open source projects sort of like cultivate active users, or in this case, active users into becoming active contributors, or kind of in the flip around, which is, you know, converting users into, you know, becoming more of a, of a contributor. And a way to do that is to put it in a way that these people come with new ideas, skills, and increase productivity by obviously improving workflow. Um, not just because of the ability to code, you know, documentation and fixing bug, but also to go out there and talk about the project, which is kind of like how my flow went, um, you know, during the OLPC days. But then another thing here is to make sure that, you know, people are engaging with each other, you know, providing support. Uh, and multiple ways we've seen this over the years is, you know, typical show IRC channel uh, for people that have been the OGs in the open source space for a while. And now in the modern day open source community, um, platforms like Discord, where a lot of people are either a uh, uh, software project, a company project, or open source project sort of like rely on. But at the end of the day, it's a place where you sort of like bring people all together 
for them to share ideas, but also provide support independently. And one of my friends keeps saying the best successful community is the one that, you know, help each other without the, um, you know, so an extra support from the project lead or from the uh, paid community manager, but rather users talking to each other. Um, yeah, again, like I said, um, I don't know if any of you, of you remember this, but uh, for some of you that might be seeing this for the first time, um, this is this is basically the the OFC project, uh, or just popular people know as the uh, one laptop a child uh, uh, project. Uh, it's been there for I don't know how long, but I would say over seventeen years now, which is interesting. Um, and the really this how this is really cool. <laughs> yeah, Patrick, yeah, you mentioned. I think I have some somewhere somewhere around here. But the reason why this is actually really cool is because this solved a lot of problems, right? A lot of problems that I would say that might not necessarily be more intentional, maybe breaking any grounds, but I would say it solved a lot of simple problems. And, and, and in this case, like, you know, myself as an example was one of the success stories of why um, this project was really successful. But the cool thing about the, 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 the hardware is not necessarily about how interesting and weird this desktop is looking, but but also like the decisions that, that went behind the scene, which was, you know, the exact operating system, why it should be running open source rather than closed source. And not just any open source project, but also a particular type of open source. Yes, there was a, uh, I would say there was a custom made uh, uh, graphical user interface uh, called the Sugar Desktop, which is primarily designed for the hardware because you know there were a lot of um, I would say really great open source project out there, or we say open source uh, desktop out there, that in my opinion would exactly solve the need of what they were going for, and I'll explain what, what, why those decisions were really cool. Yeah. So again, the hardware, obviously, any operating system or any um, um, really cool hardware projects. You, you know, from your Android to whatever um, hardware project you're using, uh, the, the, the great combination of the software side and the hardware side is what makes the project really successful. So obviously on the outside, it's a really weird looking laptop, which was really great, uh, really strong at that point. I remember breaking it a couple of times, fixing it a couple of times. But then when I asked the question over the years, I'm like, why did you, you all went with this exact design and make it so rigid. And uh, the, the reply I remember from um, both Nicolas Negroponte and also Walter Bender, which is the, the co-founder for Sugar Labs, uh, they mentioned that the, the reason why they made the design of this, this uh, uh, interesting uh, laptop was so that um, um, the young people or people using the, the laptop will be thinking about ways that they could fix it on their own and on their own terms. So they, make, they made it so fixable and they made it in a way that even if it falls down or break or some level of obviously not into the really core component, the hardware is going to be like the hardware will keep running over time. And I saw this over the years because obviously uh, I was a little bit rougher uh, uh, at the beginning when I got the, the hardware, but then that sort of made me to be more engineering focused, like hardware engineering focused by going on and fixing the, the, the computer. And one interesting um, um, thing that I saw is um, while back in school, when we had access to this, uh, I realized joining the club and I was one of the people fixing, um, you know, the hardware for a lot of people, you know, fixing the motherboard, fixing the screen, fixing the keyboard, fixing the mouse and fixing the battery. There were just a lot of things that I would say was a little bit interesting. And that sort of like, you know, opened my eye to a lot of possibilities when it comes to uh, uh, um, hardware projects. But then the other side of the project, which I think um, didn't really get, a, I would say got a lot of spotlight, but not in the way that I felt like a lot of people did pay attention, was the sugar side of the project. So it, it was a really interesting name called Sugar. Um, the story behind why it's called Sugar, it was because uh, the, 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 the early contributor of the project, uh, because obviously this was based for kids. Uh, they, they felt like kids play a lot with sweet stuff. So that's sort of like, you know, uh, that's sort of like pioneered the name of the name Sugar Dexter. And I think um, um, the, the multiple releases they made over the years was sort of like, uh, I would say some sweet name. I think 
uh, I can't remember, there was uh, raspberry uh, at some point. I think there was some other things that they sort of like called different version of sugar uh, over the years, which I, was, I felt like was really, really cool. Um, but then the interesting thing about, like I said, the interesting thing about the software that sort of made the hardware project really, really successful was the fact that the, 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 the design thinking, um, so first they were trying to make it not so pretty in a way that it was going to annoy you as a user. Uh, so when I got this uh, hardware, I remember the first time I got the, the computer from school, uh, I went back home and I wanted to install, um, I know the Europeans call it football, but then the Americans call it soccer. But because I'm in Nigeria right now, I'm going to stick to you know football. So I would wake up the next day, <laughs> right? Because a, a lot of people find it very expensive when you call football soccer. But yeah, so the, the, the football game was really, really big in this part of the world, obviously, also in some part of uh, um, Europe. So it was no um, um, uh, no brainer that um, one of the popular uh, games at that time, um, though on the Windows platform, was the FIFA and the PES. So I used to play a lot of games as a kid, um, but then having my own personal computer, I wanted to be able to make sure that I run the exact operating system in the hardware, which was pretty interesting. So what did I do? I, first, I had no idea that what I was running was totally different from what I see, you know, what I see in the classroom and also things that I see out of the classroom, which is the Windows operating system. So I, I, I took up, a, I think I remember taking up a hard drive and I copied um, an installable version of one of the game. And then I went home and I wanted to store, uh, or in this case, I wanted to run the game uh, on the OPC hardware. So by doing so, Obviously, I ran into a really interesting error that even to today, I don't really remember much on what, what, what was the exact error. But basically, I was trying to run a Windows uh, executive file, or in this case, a Windows um, app on a, uh, a Linux app, which is pretty interesting. So by doing so, obviously, I ran into an error and, and I was really frustrated at the beginning uh, to the point that I spent a whole lot of time, um, you know, um, going into the internet and finding out why this wasn't running, right? Because that was the first thing that I observed. But what I did not know was that these things were designed in a way that it's, it's going to make me frustrated enough to go into the internet and search for, for, for answers. So in this sense, it was so minimal. There was less information. It was just so basic that um, if you look at it from the first glance, you're gonna you, you're just gonna like, oh, what is this, and how do I interact with this hardware? So apparently, that was you know a, a very conscious effort from the, the the sugar community because they wanted people to be frustrated by default, and it worked. And so because I was frustrated, I went over to the internet and I was searching um, through the internet. Then I discovered the community behind the sugar uh, operating system because I only knew about the the hardware Dex, the, the hardware project, because of it was, um, um, I think at that time, there was a first party um, deployment in my country at that time. But then I had less information about the, the, the operating system itself. So now, um, one interesting thing there was by going through the uh, community, I thought, oh, there's an interesting programming language called Python. And I was like, oh, OK. Um, I was a much, much younger than in school. And then I was like, okay, so there's this thing called Python. There's this thing called open source. There's this uh, operating system that is not Windows and it's so weird. And for some reason can't run my game. So how do I fix this? <laughs> so that was a, sort of the first thing I thought about. The first thing I wanted to do was to take the entire operating system away from the hardware and put in Windows to run the game. But obviously that was a limitation of of, 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 of that, obviously. So obviously I got, I got stuck and I was like, okay, I probably need to fix this. So basically I started learning basic Python, again, out of frustration, uh, and then eventually started playing around the, the sugar environment. Then I discovered that it was 100% designed for education and designed for the classroom. Uh, but also one interesting thing there was the fact that it was also created in a way that it was gonna make me think more as an engineer, which was uh, something that I would say not all the operating system uh, are designed to do. Those ones are designed for perfection in a way that the users tend to think less. 
but this one was designed the way that users are going to get frustrated enough to become contributors. That was sort of like the, the strategy behind, you know, the project itself. So, um, oh, I went too far. Okay. So now if you look into the side of the, the screen, uh, you're going to see, um, multiple icons that sort of like round and then the whole exo thing. So basically the, the methodology or the ideology here was this side of the, the, the X section here is basically me, or in this case, the user. And then the, 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 I don't know, pa I don't, Patrick, can you see my screen or so? I'm just making sure that the things that I'm pointing. Are yeah, we can see the pointer. Okay. Okay. Great. So, yeah, so the, the little icon under here is showing what I'm using at that particular point. So basically I'm using the browser activity and then things that are sort of like surround around are things that I'm not currently using, but then it's called the activity. Now, the reason why it wasn't called an application was because the ideology around the sugar desktop is a playing ground, an open playing ground where a kid is having a lot of options to play around multiple toys, if that makes sense. So these are things that you're currently not using, but they are available for you to use. That was sort of like the, the design ideology here. And then around the side, it's typical, the, the, the typical um, icon that you get to see on, on your laptop. So here, um, the circle one, I believe was the internet or showing that I was connect, currently connected to a, an internet. Here is um, the, the level for my speaker. And also here is the level also for my battery, basically the battery indicator. And then this section here, um, when you're connected to the internet and you're close to a lot of people using the Excel computer, um, the, the, the GUI, um, or in this case, the sugar um, um, user interface would show a lot of people around this section showing that you're connected to uh, uh, people around you, if that makes sense. And then you can be able to collaborate, if that makes sense. So, and then over here was something called the, this first icon here was called the, I believe was called the neighborhood. So the neighborhood is in this case, is sort of like, um, uh, you remember if you're in a place on your smartphone and then you go to your Wi-Fi indicator and then you press that button, you're gonna see the, an available, or in this case, um, an available network that you can connect to. Or I would say if you're using the iPhone and you open your airdrop and you make your airdrop um, more uh, public, you're gonna see people that are around you that are sort of like, you know, uh, ready for, 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 for you to be able to share things with. So that's kind of like what the neighborhood was. So the concept of neighborhood was a place where everyone that uses the EXO can see each other and collaborate. And then the second icon there was for like the group people that you've made, not just your neighbor anymore, but in this, I wouldn't say courts, but more like a special group of people, which is interesting. And then obviously this part here, which is I'm currently on, is called the home, which is where I get to play a lot of things. And then I think this part here is called the journal. So the way Sugar worked was that they, they noticed that kids often can't always, um, by default, um, when they're working on an application, or in this case, an activity, they're having to always save your file by, 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 by manual, way of doing so can be a little bit tricky for kids. So by default, anytime you play with any activities, by default, that activity gets saved or in this case, um, saved in a way, I would say the closest way to doing that is, um, you know, thinking about always committing your changes, if that makes sense, if you're using Git, right? So that's, that's, so that's kind of like uh, the ideology behind uh, that structure. But then the cool thing here was that every single thing here was written, or in this case, is written in Python. Um, and and, and, and the, the ideology behind that was the fact that, one, Python is obviously one of the easiest programming language by default to jump on. Um, uh, and also a lot of uh, educational institutes uses Python to teach a uh, concept of programming language. And of course, it's, it's the closest language, maybe at that time, I don't know if there's something now that is much, much, much easier to read. But at that time, it was the easiest programming language that uh, anyone can relate with or the closest thing to English language. So the ideology behind the, the, the structure of the intentional uh, or the, the technology picked to build this operating system was very intentional. So what that means is that the you take one language to build application, you also take one language to also modify the entire operating system. So this entire operating system here was, uh, was based on the, 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 Genome, the Genome Toolkit 
that's the, the, the GNU, um, the GNU um, um, desktop environment, which you see by default for the Ubuntu and Fedora and the rest. So I think the, the there was a tweak version of the GNOME toolkit, which I think the GNOME toolkit itself primarily was written in C, uh, C programming language. But of course, you can be telling uh, uh, kids to go learn C, uh, which is pretty interesting. So they created a, a different version of, of the GNOME toolkit called the Pi GTK, uh, which is a Python version of the, of the GTK uh, 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 um, um, toolkit itself. So by doing so, that made a lot of things in this operating system much tweakable and much, much um, um, usable. Again, again, going back to the ideology of making your user becoming a, a, you know, a contributor. Now, uh, I don't know if you can really see this, uh, um, uh, but this is just um, uh, a kind of a snapshot. You can go to github.com and, and check this out. So if you go to github.com um, slash sugar labs, um, uh, you're going to see a lot of, uh, uh, I would say, applications, or in this case, how um, the sugar activities itself, again, going back to each of these icons, you're going to see how each of these icons uh, are sort of like buttes. Uh, this way, it's very strong. Okay, okay. So you're going to see how um, each of these icons uh, are sort of like buttes. So if you look into the, the skeleton of each of um, applications, just so I don't confuse a lot of people and just to applications here. But um, if you're looking at the skeleton of the application, you're going to see that this is basically um, uh, the, the, the file structure is kind of like what you see on your modern day um, web application, right? Uh, if you're building a web app, uh, if you're building a, maybe a typical HTML, CSS, and JavaScript kind of a, a, a file structure. So the file structure here is so interesting because um, 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 they made it so easy that you can. Um, this is going to be interesting. You can sugarize your typical application. So basically, you can take a Python, uh, you can take Python uh, a program language, you can build a program, and then if you want to sugarize that program, if you want to make that program that is away from sugar, but you want to make it more as an application, all you basically do is just to bond to that application using the sugar, sugar labs, or in this case, the sugar file structure. Uh, uh, and then you, can, then you can make it more of an executable file that the sugar itself can run on your operating system. So basically what that did was that a lot of people were building um, um, different ideas, um, different things from different deployments, but also when they wanted to make it or, uh, runnable um, or, or on the OPC hardware, they were able to bundle that using the sugar uh, 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 activity uh, creation structure. So one of the popular ones is basically um, you know, um, 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 pinging the sugar activity um, um, structure, and then obviously importing the the, the body builder again, basically bundling bundling every single thing that you built, and it makes it more um, executable. And one of the cool things, and the reason why this was really really successful, was because um, um, every single person that was involved in the software project was coming from an educational background, so that the documentation was so interesting that um, regardless of um, your your ideology, regardless of whatever experience that you have uh, in, in programming, you can basically take that and you can basically build your own apps. So back then in school, when I was um, I was spending a lot of time, um, this was the first time. It was it's, it's actually really interesting because one on the first side, it sort of like made me understood that oh, I can basically be an, a creator, right? But then on another side, that was how I discovered the open source license in the hardware. Which is pretty interesting. So basically, what happened, or what kind of trouble that I ran into, there was a um, back in the days when there was a, um, um, I would say um, the 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 era of Flash, um, Flash player on the browser. Uh, I don't know if most people remember that. Uh, so there used to be a lot of games that were based on Flash, like the Adobe, uh, Adobe Flash players. So there was this game I was playing a lot. I was spending a lot of time on the internet. Um, on the internet cafe, you spend a lot of time. But then I wanted that application, or in this case, I wanted that Flash player to be publicly accessible to people within my community at that time, and also the global community, people using the Sugar. And I think it was about 2 million plus people that were actively using Sugar desktop. So what I did was, again, thinking as a kid, I went to the browser, and I um, I think it was Firefox, and then I just pressed the Control S, and then I saved assets. And then um, by doing so, if you save the assets on, on the internet, automatically you, you, you 
uh, the browser would pull the Flash player, uh, the Flash, the the game that is based on Flash on the folder. So basically, what I did was I was able to um, again sugarize, or in this case, I was able to to uh, bond to that Flash player by importing. Um, I think there was a popular Flash player on, on the GNOME desktop called the Ganache. I think it's the Ganache player. I think that was what it was. Uh, sorry, I'm sort of like thinking back as far back as 2013, 2014. So my memory is a little bit funny right now. So um, I was able to import the Ganache player and that, that player was able to execute that file and then I was able to run it. But then when I was running it, um, I just, because it was sugar, I was able to uh, uh, put in a license that enabled people to contribute. But then the license was interesting because uh, within the file structure, there was a lot of proprietary file that was in that, that um that desktop oh, sorry that application at that time and i had no idea because again i was so young and I had no idea what open source license was so i was just me trying to fix a problem and that was what some, um, that, that was what sort of what i was thinking at that time but then the cool thing there was why i wasn't running into an issue at that time was by making it at that time by making the application more um the, the um, bringing the file from the internet and making it sugarized and making it um, um, runnable on the Excel uh, computer, um, I was able to um, bundle it and make it um, 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 a file that I could be able to share. So that was the first time I discovered GitHub uh, uh, as a platform. I think that was like 2013, 2014 also. Uh, so I, I created my first GitHub account and then I uploaded the file, uh, like basically this whole file structure that you're seeing here to it so that more people could contribute into the project and also um, um, add local language so that they could you know, run this application in your own local language for people that are not native English speaker. Uh, now, the cool thing about that was because I was able to do that uh, on the Sugar App Store, because Sugar had an app store um, back then, um, so, so, so some kind of like a Play Store and App Store kind of a file. I remember the application as a whole got over 36,000 downloads within the space of I would say four to five months alone. And this is just within the Sugar App Store. And this is not even accountable for people that were taking um, the file from hard drive to hard drive or flash drive to flash drive. So what I saw was a lot of people globally using the software that I created and they were using it and it was so interesting. Not until when um, you know it got to the point where we, we were doing a lot of cleanup then we discovered that the, the, the license that I put in was, was not obviously uh, Good and also making me a good open source citizen, right? Which is pretty cool, which is pretty annoying at that point, but it was something that um, we had to take it off. But then the cool thing here was that remember the storyline? I wanted to install a game. I was frustrated. I got it over to the internet. I discovered Python. I discovered the concept of sugar. I started modifying sugar. And then at some point, I started creating applications by myself enough to share. And then that also made a lot of people to collaborate and then to also improve that software. So again, going from a typical user over to become a software engineer, I would say, to becoming an app, app uh, 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 creator and also uh, maintaining uh, 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 a project which you're pretty interested. Um, again, like I tried to explain, um, again, using Sugar as a case study here, um, again, like I, I tried to explain here is Sugar is primarily written in Python, um, mostly in the PyGTK side. Um, maintained by the Sugar Labs community. Again, Sugar is a desktop, and also uh, a collection of, of uh, educational apps, or in this case, collection of activities, depending on what you use. So again, this is just kind of give you an idea of, of sort of like how the Sugar Labs project sort of like approached the whole user to contributor sort of like strategy. So this is kind of like, you know, the, the end of the case study in a way. Now, going back to, you know, sort of like the community aspect of it, uh, you know, because I do DevRel and also like lead community. Um, one of the interesting thing here, uh, again, if you have questions, again, feel free to, to drop that uh, real time. Uh, but one of the interesting thing here is the things that I've learned over the years from the Sugar Desktop to working for companies, leading DevRel, doing community building and, you know, building um, what people would say the largest open source group on the continent of Africa is, again, making sure that things are very, very clear. Like making sure that you get, and this is one of the biggest challenges we see, is making sure that you meet your users where they are. 
uh, I know sometimes it can be a little bit tricky, especially if you're trying to be a, an open source PRist, uh, especially when it comes to the tools that you get to use. But most of the time, you, there's a certain level of healthy compromise that you need to make if you're trying to approach and get more people into into that space. So for example, I saw Sugar Labs moving from um, from um, 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 IRC to Discord to approach to to get some people that were you know in a different world to sort of like give them the ideology that yeah you can be able to do things very very differently and also building a supporting community environment this is really really important these are things that things that people tend to overlook a lot because you know they feel like oh if I get people into my community uh, uh, they can just find a way around and get things done most of the time except someone is really frustrated like me. Most of the time, you know, you see people bouncing back and you know being in that that space. Another thing which I think is, I would say, the most important part is creating a user-friendly documentation and resources. This was something that was a key strength for the OVC project and also for the Sugarlast project and also projects that I've been involved with over the years. And also, which uh, some people would now tag as a mastership program or whatever, um, but also showcasing contributors' achievement and impact on the project. This is a way for you to like tell the contributors that, hey, you know what? We're seeing what you're doing. We're seeing what you're doing for the community and also appreciating your effort. Um, you know, developing structure onboarding process for new contributors is also something that I would say a lot of people don't really take as, 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 as important as, as possible. But one of the ways you look into these things is, um, I would say, establishing a pretty interesting onboarding process so that in a way that when a, a, a contributor comes into your project, it's, there's a very clear path to how do I become uh, a contributor down to becoming a mentor. Um, one interesting way I saw um, that worked really well was when Sugar Lab used to be part of um, the Google X project called the Google Coding. Um, I don't know if people know what Google Coding was, but Google Coding was uh, uh, a kind of a, a dedicated program that enabled pre-K or in this case pre-university students to think beyond using open source to becoming more of an open source um, contributor. But also by doing so, when you're successfully done with the Google Coding, you're eventually becoming a mentor. I remember when I used to contribute to Google Coding as a as a as a user, uh, but also. At the, uh, over the years, I became a mentor. But again, making it so clear that you know the process is so straightforward that a user can understand how I can become a contributor, but also see how I can become from a contributor down to becoming a maintainer and also becoming you know a, a mentor that can mentor more people. Uh, another thing, like I said, is implementing recognition program for active contributors. This sort of like in a way for you to encourage more users to sort of like stay uh, within your your, your program. Uh, another another thing here is again this is typical Google Sum of Code uh, outreachy and sort of a thing. It's sort of like pairing newcomers to you know experienced mentors for guidance and support. You get to see this in external programs, but you also get to see this in internal programs. But uh, again, this is things that I see that have worked really really well over the years that I've you know become an open source uh, user myself. And also encouraging um, knowledge sharing and collaboration among contributors. Um, the last, um, um, so I used to work at Sourcegraph. Uh, uh, Sourcegraph is a code search uh, company. Uh, I was leading DevRel. And one of the things there was the fact that um, the, 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 the business model of, of, of Sourcegraph uh, used to be more focused on the B2B level. But then we wanted to push it in a way that developers can care about code search too, not necessarily companies uh, caring about it, but also individual developers can see the value for the product we were doing. And by doing so, I was able to launch I initiate something called a content or a community generated content program where uh, we encourage users to share and write about the experiences. And by doing so, it encourages more users that are curious to sort of like try out too and also do the same thing. So there was sort of like a loop that was going on between trying to two, share, um, 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 writing about your opinion and also sharing it within your own community. And that sort of itself. You know, bring a lot of like you know um, curiosity and people coming to your project. Um, before I go into the C side, I see that it sounds like the Sugar Project actually introduced frustration to drive user development. So, 
If so, how am I this? Okay, so um, there's a question here from Patrick saying, it sounds like the Sugar project actually introduced frustration to drive user development. An example is solve their own problems. Was this plan? If so, how might other uh, projects introduce frustration? It's rather opportunities to solve problems without driving them away. Yeah, so I think this is a really interesting uh, um, um, question. So first, um, I think the reason why um, um, by default the sugar desktop was designed in that way was because it was sort of like backed with years of experience or uh, years of research. So before, if you if you take a look at the OPC project a lot and the, and the people that were sort of like behind the sugar project, you would see that those people have been in the educational sector for a really long time. So the sugar was based on a 25 year old research on how people think. So, and within the MIT, uh, or in this case, within MIT, the, 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 uh, the MIT Media Lab that had uh, uh, a lot of project that was constantly paying attention to how people learn and how you know, kids learn. So um, the concept of kids or the way kids learn to what uh, I, I would say I remember vividly well was the fact that uh, if things are perfect, again, if you give a kid a tablet, there are higher chances that that kid within the space of a week or two is going to break that tablet because the kid is probably trying to figure out why is this thing displaying? Like th there's always this curiosity when you're much, much younger versus when you're much, much older, you know, as a kid. And so everything was sort of like designed around that, if that makes sense. But I think on the modern way of thinking about that um, is, I would say, um, one cool way I would say is Android, right? So I'll take Android as an example. Um, so I would, I, I would say, maybe this is not intentional by Google or the people that originally designed Android, but, um, if you if you're in the Android ecosystem, you would notice that um, in um, right now I'm using a Samsung Galaxy, right? And within the Samsung um, ecosystem, um, they because of the way Android was designed, it was trying to cater for a lot of users at the same time. That was a little bit interesting because that was not the Apple way of doing things. Apple wanted to do things more intentional, more perfect, and whatever. But then that was not giving room for more creativity if that makes sense. So by keeping it in the way that it was, again, maybe that was not the intention of Google, but I'm just trying to put in a, a story in that line here, but doing it in a way that, um, you know, you sort of like gave room for collaboration and gave room for, 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 for people to take and then own it. So the concept of Sugar Labs here is taking the, the concept and owning it. And not just owning it, because um, one of the things that you drive people away, uh, you know, going into this question is, when you're trying to do that frustration by default and you have no documentation to back that strategy, right? Now, one of the cool things here is the fact that documentations were out there in a way that when you take it, you look into it, it's like, oh, how do I create an application? This is the best way to do it by doing A, B, C, D, right? The easiest way, the fastest way. And now if you look into the Android ecosystem, you're going to see more than 20 plus version of Android that is different from what Google is currently maintaining. You have the One UI, you have the Oxygen OS, you have multiple versions of Android on top of Android cater for users. For example, I'm not a fan of uh, the vanilla Android because I feel like it's too basic. I'm a fan of the One UI because of, you know, it's something that Samsung over the years has integrated in a way that it just fits in their own ecosystem. But imagine the fact that Google by default wanted to do it the Apple way it was going to be again less adoption and less in this case like people are going to adopt Android way less compared to the way Apple was originally because of the fact that you know it's it's like you're forcing people on things on like you're basically forcing people on your own ideology and saying hey you can do this this way and you can do it my way and sometimes doing things my way in the sense of Okay, okay, sure, sure. Yeah, so basically, um, um, you know, when you're trying to do things in a way that you want people to come in and own ownership or take ownership, you want to do that by making sure that, you know, you have a really good documentation, right? Documentation is, you know, not just the heart of like getting people to find them to, you know, how to contribute, but also really good documentation that can make people to come in and see the reason why things are being 
the way it is, right? So that's kind of, I would say, was sort of like the thought process behind um, 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 what Sugar Labs were able to do. Now, going back to um, the C side of the of the project, right? It's like, you know, um, um, on the C side, um, you know, doing community events and engagement in, um, initiatives sort of like drive, you know, more users to becoming more of a contributor. For example, um, um, doing things around, you know, hackathon, workshop, and virtual meetups like this, so like enable people to sort of like see people sharing more use cases. Like, for example, I could talk about how I have, I took the sugar desktop and I made it my own, and I come into, into a hackathon or a workshop and I share that idea. That itself would automatically like encourage people to want to customize their own way, maybe to the way I've done mine, or for them for them to be able to do it on their own way, which is kind of really interesting. Another uh, strategy here is encouraging participation in community-driven initiatives. And so these things are sort of like things that you get to see, but also uh, another way is facilitating networking and also collaborating opportunities. So these are the, uh, on this C level, this is something that I've used on the Open Source Community Africa uh, uh, initiative. So um, I run sort of like an equivalent of like the Open Source Summit or FASTEM in Africa called the Open Source Festival. And uh, one of the reasons why that festival is successful is because we always put it in a way that we enable people to share ideas, but also we build networking as the heart of the event or as the heart of the festival. So making it possible that people can easily collaborate and also ask questions. So we've done it in 2020. We did uh, the second one in 2022. I believe, and also the, the the just one we just completed in 2023. So this is something that I see really, really successful, especially if you're building, uh, uh, if you're trying to make users uh, more of a contributor. Uh, another thing here is fostering a culture of contributions, right? So in this case, making um, your ecosystem or making the ecosystem more open for ideas, more open for feedback. Um, so automatically, this makes more people to want to contribute and share thought process. But also, I, I'm, I'm also a fan of like diverse people or diverse uh, 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 diverse people make better software, right? So basically, building a diverse and inclusive community where people feel very with, where people feel valued, right? Make sure that you know the platform becomes much, 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 much awesome. And that's, for example, why Android, in this sense, you know, tends to be really more tweakable because of the way you know uh, i would say there was a sort of like a diverse oems that that came into the android ecosystem and own that android ecosystem in their own way right um so yeah um so sort of like what are the takeaways so far i know i've been talking a lot is you know recognizing the importance of transforming users into contributors for successful open source projects again when your users are not necessarily getting their hands dirty they they, they tend to be uh, the shortage of contributors and that itself can be a little bit of a pro 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 problem if you're if you're someone that rely on on, on, on a lot of contributors um, less strategy for building supportive community environments but also providing timely support so making sure that you're very very responsive um, because sometimes that on itself can drive people away but also um, um, making sure that you have a very structured onboarding process and mentorship program that sort of like guide uh, new contributors. I remember kicking, uh, I kick started something for the, of the scalable onboarding process. Um, and the reason for that was because we wanted people that were coming out of the typical engineering um, skill set to sort of like see the Genome project and also to contribute to the Genome project. Another, another way to do that is also to emphasize the sig um, um, significance on centering um, 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 culture around contribution and, and inclusivity, which is really, really interesting. I would also um, encouraging the um, encouraging um, the community to drive, you know, basically drive passion around contributors because this on its own sort of like make sure that, you know, your, your project becomes very, very healthy. And this is something that we get to see, you know, within um, my days on the Sugar Lab side of things. Um, so, yeah, so I think that's sort of like basically, you know, what I would say has been the takeaway of like the things that I've seen move from the Sugar Labs project to you know um, building the open source community in Africa. So yeah, thank you. Ah, thank you, Samson. Um, so if folks want to uh, type in questions, um, um, I'm sure Samson can uh, 
we'll be happy to answer them. I guess I would start, I, I, as, as you were speaking, it, it definitely became sort of apparent that in order to be successful, you have to expose the gaps of the project and even the foundation so that people can step in and volunteer to take those and then give them the, how do you, how do you promote that? How do you not look like a, you know, sort of poorly run organization or project uh, exposing all your gaps and shortcomings um, so that people don't think, oh, why do I want to invest with this? Well, at the same, you know, but at the same time, fostering that interest so that people want to like, what is, how do you manage that fine line between looking like a mess and asking for help, but also looking like a project that people want to get involved with? Uh, yeah, so that's a pretty interesting question. I think um, one of the ways that I've seen this happen um, in multiple projects that I've been involved with is the fact that these things are things that you have to own. As a, as a project owner, you have to own it and say, hey, this project is not perfect, but I'm, I'm not going to make it perfect. Um, and in order to do so, I'm going to make it public. But by also making it public, you want to be able to spend it. Okay. Here's an idea that I'm working on. It's not ready. It's not perfect. Here's what we want to. This, this is the, the mission. This is where we're headed. And this is why we need you to come make us or make this project better. So typically, one of the cool things about open source or in this case, open source projects is the fact that these things are things that you get to see within the mission. But also, this also cultivates the interest of users trying to become a contributor because in this sense they notice that oh i know where this project is leading or oh, well, i know where this project is headed but because in order for us to do that we want to be able to make sure that we're enabling people to come in and add their thought process and making it better so for example when i started the open source community in africa i had no idea on what i wanted to achieve i know what i wanted to do i wanted to be able to make sure that people experience what I experience when I travel, uh, you know, go to going to conferences. But also I wanted um, projects, you know, the Western projects to come in and find users and also to find contributors. And to do that, I was able to do something, right? But not perfect. It was actually really crazy at that time. But I did it in a way that, that it on its own attracts people to say, hey, I have this idea. Why don't you do it this way? I'm like, okay, cool. Please take it and then you own that process. So again, Making it in a way that by doing so, you're also telling people that you're accepting, you know, you're accepting and also you're, you're accepting the fact that, oh, you want people to bring ideas and also to own the ideas and also to implement that ideas. So making sure there's a strategy around that sort of like, you know, uh, make it a, a, a lot easier and not make it look like you, you know, you're lost and not um, you know, intentional about making your project much cooler. Um, so, yeah, so I think that that's that's the fact that. Uh, Oh, thanks. And there's a there's another question here. Um, I don't know, see in the chat. Um, he has a quest. Uh, Chuck has a question about the MIT effect in terms of pulling folks toward a project. MIT had a lot of international press and presence with the OLPC project. Would you have been as excited if OLPC came from, say, University of Arizona, and there was no uh, Nicholas Negroponte? and MIT Media Lab glow around the project. So obviously the question is sort of like, what role does sort of that prestige play? Yeah, so to be honest with you, at first I had no idea that MIT Media Lab, um, MIT was involved in the project. I, I, like all I knew was, oh, this like, it, it, like basically the concept here was a piece of hardware was shared in my school to a lot of people. And then we just took it and started using it. Like maybe in the US, I could understand that could be an influence, but from where I was coming from, it was not, I didn't even know what MIT was, to be honest to you. Like I, I had no idea what it was. I didn't even know who Nicola, Nicolas Negroponte was. In fact, the first one year of the project, I had no idea who Nicolas Negroponte was until I, I would say, I think I, when I started actively contributing to the project, then I was just curious about like, oh, what is the story behind 
this crazy idea. And then that's where the whole Nicolas de Buponte started. I actually never met Nicolas, but I met a lot of people that were sort of like involved. I spoke to him virtually, but the whole concept of MIT Media Lab, Nicolas de Buponte glow in this sense was when I became an active contributor, a decision maker, and I started doing things that needed that fostering this collaboration in, in a way. So I don't think it was more around where it was coming from. It was just more around the concept behind it, if that makes sense. Yeah. And it's not like, oh, when you turn on the computer, there was like, oh, this thing was designed by the MIT, so you can use it. No, it was not around that. It was just like, you turn on something, it was just very basic, and you're just wondering, oh, how do I get to use this? this tool? So yeah. Got it. Well, that it's top of the hour. So um, let's one more call if there's any questions. Uh, I see uh, someone typing. Um, but uh, give them a second to, to finish up if there's a last question. Oh, no question. All right. Well, uh, Sam, thank you very much uh, for your insights. I was taking notes feverishly. I'm tempted to to put my camera screen on just so I, you know, I think a lot of the stuff is that you've talked about isn't just applicable to individual projects, but from a foundation perspective, um, I think it's also applicable. How can a perio um, expose our gaps and be honest with where we are and our needs while defining our goals and giving folks opportunities to participate in, you know, the, the, the growth and maturity of the foundation, not just the project. So it's been very useful. Um, thanks so much. And um, I am sure I will see you at All Things Open or Educause or uh, Open Source Summit or something soon. Uh, but I want to thank you again uh, for taking the time to speak with the Aperio community. Um, and I will see you later. I'll just turn off the. Awesome. Okay.